Molweni. It's the State of the Nation Address Week when we listen to the President and his cabinet set out the agenda for the country this year. But the stakes have never been higher. We are still yet to see a single vaccine administered following the disappointing results revealed about the efficacy of the AstraZeneca vaccine meant to be rolled out this week. In addition to all of this, the country's economy is now on the edge of collapse. This week, we unpack everything you can and should expect from SONA 2021. But first, we take a look at the weekend headlines. Esma Khashoggi has come out guns blazing in defense of former President Jacob Zuma. President Zuma has a right to do whatever he wants to do. Just leave him. What, what, is, what, is, a, what is a problem? What has Zuma done now? Let's give former President Jacob Zuma time and space to think about this. The Tea Party between former President Jacob Zuma and EFF leader Julius Malema at Nkandla seems to be the talk of the town. From foe to friends, the former President Jacob Zuma and EFF leader Julius Malema seem to have put their differences aside, at least for the time being. The Democratic Alliance says that whilst its supporters land restitution and uh, redistribution, it's opposed to any attempts by the ANC and the EFF to amend the constitution for land expropriation without compensation. The 2019 Good Governance Index found that 15 well-run municipalities were actually under the control of the DA. Today, the opposition party will be hosting what it says is the first of its kind summit to look at what innovative governance can do to improve the lives of people. This week in the headlines, the Zondo Commission puts its foot down and lays a criminal complaint against Jacob Zuma. It turns out the 1 million AstraZeneca vaccines delivered have an incredibly low efficacy rate against the new variant. And they say a week is a long time in politics. Nothing demonstrated this more than the foes turned bosom buddies, Jacob Zuma and his prodigal son, Juju, sharing a cup of tea. But first up, last week, the first one million doses of COVID-19 vaccines arrived from India, welcomed by President Ramaphosa and a massive cabinet delegation with much fanfare. The photo op wasn't complete without the president himself inspecting the consignment delivery tags. But the celebration seemingly was short-lived when it turned out that the vaccines are expiring in two months' time. To make matters worse, these vaccines might not be as effective against the current dominant COVID-19 variant in South Africa. This is really disappointing. On the cusp of a third wave, South Africa has been waiting eagerly for the rollout of an effective vaccine for our healthcare workers and our frontline workers. We understand that this is a highly volatile and forever changing scientific environment. The emergence of the new variant further complicates the response by the South African government and means that we ought to be agile and thorough in our approach and our strategy. That's why it's absolutely inexcusable that we negotiated at a higher price the procurement of the AstraZeneca vaccine from India without due diligence factoring in the expiry date of these vaccines. But we stand ready to support government with concrete, credible, and implementable recommendations during this crisis. This is because an effective vaccine is the only way that we can regain some kind of normality in South Africa and save lives and livelihoods. Last week, the Mail and Guardian likened the tea party between Julius Malema and Jacob Zuma as a reunion of Stalin and Hitler. And frankly, we couldn't agree more. It seems the love has been restored just in time for Valentine's Day. While this was a sneaky distraction tactic from the corruption scandals plaguing them both, the reality here is that there could just be a serious realignment of politics underway. It is now clearer than ever that the ANC and the EFF's interests are fundamentally aligned and are in opposition to that of ordinary South Africans. 
It seems the list of state capture scandals revealed by the Zondo Commission extends far beyond the Guptas. Last week, John Stiernes submitted questions regarding Qaeda deployment that the Commission must put to President Ramaphosa that he needs to answer to and he needs to explain why his party is still pursuing its explicit project of state capture through the formal policy of cater deployment, despite knowing that it is directly responsible for the rampant pro-corruption that we see across all government institutions with zero accountability. The cater deployment policy directs that state institutions be staffed with ANC loyalists so as to gain control of all levers of state machinery, including those that are meant to check and balance power. Ramaphosa has a lot of explaining to do in respect to his role in advancing state capture through this deployment policy. Meanwhile, the fight to protect property rights continues in Parliament this month. The expropriation bill has been published and is open for public comments. The DA will obviously be making our own submission, but we believe that it's important that each and every South African makes their voice heard. This bill will allow government to take your property without any compensation. Even if you don't own a house or a piece of land, remember that your car, the money in your savings account, or even copyrighted business ideas are also your property and they're vulnerable to expropriation. Send your objections now via email to expropriationbill at parliament.gov.za or via WhatsApp to 060-550-9848. It's hopefully game over for the master of dodgeball, Jacob Zuma. Last week, the Zondo Commission officially laid a criminal complaint against the former president for failing to appear and to testify before the commission in January this year. The commission has also said that it will take further action against Zuma should he fail to obey his summons issued for his appearance next week. This follows Zuma's very absurd statement that he would rather be arrested, prosecuted and jailed than testify before the commission. Well, here's your chance, Firepool King. Go ahead and make our day. Meanwhile, instead of criticizing this constitutional delinquency, President Ramaphosa essentially told the nation to, you know, back off Zuma and give him space to think and reflect. The man has been dodging jail for more than a decade. How much more time does he need to reflect on his accused crimes? And with Ace Makhashule adding his voice to say Zuma has a right to do whatever he wants, we saw the ANC out in full force defending their favorite number one. Zuma must face the full consequences of his middle finger to the constitution, just like any other citizen would have to do. The law must now take its course. Finally, some positive news on successes in delivery for the people. Last week, the DA held a full day innovation summit showcasing the very best of DA governments across South Africa. Western Cape Premier Alan Windy, DA mayors, as well as other leaders and experts participated in the summit. They unpacked issues around innovation from supporting small businesses during a pandemic to a water project in Guha dealing with the prolonged drought and DA-run municipalities looking set to become load shedding free. There are many ways that which DA governments innovate and improve the lives of ordinary citizens. For those who didn't catch it live, you can still watch it on our YouTube channel. In the spotlight this week, this year's State of the Nation address is upon us and with South Africa arguably facing its biggest post-democratic crisis to date. We we'll look at what you should expect from this year's address. Let's take a look at the story in the spotlight. A big week in politics with President Cyril Ramaphosa's State of the Nation address coming on Thursday. We know the economy is gloomy, unemployment at its peak. What can we expect the president to say that will give hope to South Africans? I think we've heard way too many speeches that have been about inspiration and have been about, you know, feel good sensibilities. And I don't think that that's what the country needs right now. It's almost like the school of thought has remained the same. The ANC says that we are pro-poor, pro-black. 
but does that really translate into the transformation that we want to see? Well, that's always the problem. That's what it comes down to is implementation. Uh, you can make any announcement you like at Sona. It's come, it comes down to the implementation. I think that's where the last two Sonas have fallen short. It needs a president who's going to say, here are the top five practical steps that will be taken. Anything short of that is just going to be missed by the people of South Africa. We need a country that can say these are the mandates of this president and this is what we can hold him accountable. A big week in politics indeed. Before we get stuck into the discussion, I want to take a look back at the past year since the last Sona was delivered by President Ramaphosa. He made a number of prom promises. First up, a promise was made to introduce coding and robotics in 200 schools, but this is yet to be implemented in a single school. On crime, a commitment was made to strengthen anti-gang units with priority being given to the Western Cape, the Eastern Cape, Gauteng and Free State. However, it seems police officers were sent to patrol our beaches instead. Sweeping promises were made to tackle corruption with a joint working group set up to tackle the scourge. But over 13 billion rand is estimated to have been lost to, PP cor to PPE corruption alone as caters take full advantage of the pandemic for their own gain, among them allegedly being the president's own spokesperson. Ramaphosa also announced that we were set for massive intervention with youth unemployment, but we have literally over 50% of young people that are work without work and without any opportunity to get ahead. And finally, he committed to put measures in place to enable municipalities in good financial standing to procure their own power from independent power producers. But we are yet to see a single municipality be legally allowed to break free from ESCOM's devastating grip. And now, this morning, I'm joined in studio by John Stenhazen, the DA leader. Hello, John. Welcome hey, back. Hey, sir. Great to be with you again and great to be with all the viewers at home. And I'm joined by the DA chief whip and the chief whip of the official opposition. Hello, Tash. Hi, sir. Good to be here. Good. Let's jump straight into it. John, this week you delivered what you termed the true state of the nation address. I want I wanted to take a quick look at that. At, at that. The only thing we can do is immediately open up our entire economy, keeping people as safe as humanly possible, and then start with a program of aggressive and bold economic reform. And this is where the likes of Sora Maposa and Tito Mbaweni are going to have to make a big choice between the unity of their party and the progress of our country. It's one or the other. You cannot have both. They're going to have to choose between either the outdated 20th century ideology of state control that has tied us to a low growth path for decades, or a loosening of the state's grip so that the private sector can thrive and create jobs. They're going to have to choose between either bending the knee to unions or embracing labor reforms to make South Africa an attractive investment destination. They're going to have to choose between spiraling national debt with the prospect of a default looming on the horizon or a debt stabilization program to cap this at a manageable level. They're going to have to choose between a government monopoly on energy supply with all its load shedding and spiraling costs, or an energy market that is open to far more independent suppliers and competition. They're going to have to choose between the crippling effects of triple BEE or a version of empowerment that doesn't chase away investments and actually targets those South Africans who are most in need of redress. They're also going to have to choose between expropriation without compensation or strong property rights. In short, they're going to have to make a choice between party and country. And sadly, this is something they've never been able to get right. John, straight to you. Every year we say this is the most important State of the Nation address, but tell us why this particular one 
is we are at a crossroads. Well, thanks. I mean, you know, and again, it is a bit hackneyed that, you know, this is the most important sonar. But in this case, it really is the most important sonar. Mm -hmm. The country is on its knees. Uh, it's facing a crisis on three fronts. It's facing a pandemic crisis uh, with the coronavirus uh, running rampant across the country. It's facing an economic crisis as unemployment soars, businesses close down, the economy contracts, debt rises and uh, treasuries forecasts are made a lie of. And it faces a democratic crisis with the revelations out of the Zondo Commission, the specter of state capture and the looting that is still continuing unabated under President Ramaphosa. There's are three huge crises and the president's gonna have to have to address these because we can't have lofty ideals. Last year it was bullet trains and cities in the sky and you know, all these wonderful things. South Africans are tired of that. They want action, not words, action. They want things that are gonna make a meaningful difference in their lives from the moment that they're announced. That's what the president needs to do. A brass tax, straight to the basic sonar that focuses on what we can do to get South Africa working and get South Africans back to work. Mm. Well, do you agree? I mean, this is probably the, the biggest test of his presidency. I mean, it's been three years and people have been kind to him saying, mm. you know, he's trying to undo the nine wasted years. I mean, would you agree that this is like ultimately his big test? Absolutely. It is, it is without a doubt uh, the make or break sonar for President Ramaphosa. He's wasted the last uh, three years with dithering around uh, without tabling an economic reform package and getting it to the floor of parliament so that we can start to enact his, his, uh, his economic recovery. Uh, he has mollycoddled crooks and the corrupt within his own organization, not dealing with the corrupt as he promised, but promoting them into positions in his own cabinet. And he's made lots of promises, and as the beginning of the show showed, that he just simply hasn't kept. Mm. I think that he's, he's got a credibility crisis, I think there's a huge gap between uh, between the people and government, and I think they're tired of seeing a government taking power away from them to make decisions about their lives. They want their power back, and we need to find a way to ensure that that mm. happens. I want to come to you, uh, Tash. Uh, Chief Whip of the Official Opposition has a massive role to play. I mean, we talk about you lead the shadow cabinet in Parliament. A lot of people, you know, will make jokes about what is the shadow cabinet. Why is this an important feature? Why do we have a shadow cabinet? And what work do we do uh, as a shadow cabinet? So we actually are a constitutionally mandated body. Mm -hmm. And that's why you have a chief whip of the official opposition. And that's why you have an official opposition that is separated from other opposition parties mm -hmm. in the parliament of South Africa. So what we do as the shadow cabinet is we mirror the cabinet that is in existence at the moment. And we make slight alterations. For example, we don't think that minerals and energy should be clumped into one portfolio. We think that they are important enough to be two separate portfolios uh, as it is right now. So we have a shadow minister of energy and a shadow minister of minerals, for example. And then what we do is we put together workable solutions that we can offer the government if we come into a time of crisis. So the very first thing we did as a shadow cabinet was when we realized we were going into a hard lockdown. John instructed me to call together the shadow cabinet and we immediately put together plans uh, that we could give to the ANC government where if we were in uh, cabinet now and if we were the, in the governing party this is what we would be doing to roll out and mitigate the crisis mm. and we do this all the time and I don't think that it's something that the public always see so they hear about shadow ministers and they think, well, this is just something that we've made up. Well, it isn't. It's something that the government uh, forms very much part of the government and the government structure in South Africa. And it's the shadow cabinet that keeps a very close eye and holds the actual cabinet to account. And Siv, I think no one's done it better in the COVID crisis than you, keeping a really close eye on the Minister of Health and the rollout of the vaccines. And let's never forget the... Um, scooter ambulances and you going around the country doing oversight. I think you've demonstrated better than anyone in the COVID crisis just how important a shadow minister is. Mm. And I mean, look, a lot of people say, oh, you know, the DA loves to whine mm. and we, and 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 this is my, my, my biggest bed, but where people say you'd like to point out what's wrong mm. with government. I mean, 
What is accountability? Why is it important? I mean, it's, it's in our constitution. Look, Siv, I proudly hold the title as South Africans' current. I mean, I think they should just change it from current to Natasha. Let's just be fair. It's not fair to current. Let's just call it the Tash. Um, but, you know, why it's important is because, yes, the public think that we whine a lot. Yeah. But... I love the analogy of whining yeah. to get the wine industry going again. We <laughs> whined enough to get the wine industry yeah, open yeah. again. We whined enough to get e-commerce open again. Yeah, yeah. We whined about the chickens that we couldn't get cooked mm. uh, at our local shops, mm. but we got cooked food mm. out again. Mm. So we whine, but I mean, you call it whining, I call it holding the government to account. And we have to persist and we have to nag until we get the results that we want. So it's not just a situation, we will never whine about something unless we have a solution to the problem. Mm. So we will never complain about something if we can't offer you the solution. And that's why the DA website has never been more important because I challenge anyone in this country to say that we've whined about something and haven't offered a solution. All our solutions are there. There is an amazing booklet that we have released this week. John released it when he did his True State of the Nation. And it's a summary of all the portfolios where the shadow ministers have identified the biggest problems and how the DA would tackle those problems if we're in government. And we didn't keep that booklet to ourselves. We gave that booklet to the ANC and we've offered the ANC the solutions that we think are workable. I just wanna say, yeah. I mean, this is my big frustration. And um, you know, Siv, uh, it's my bugbear as well. <laughs> And you know, it goes further than that. You've even got leading, like a leading columnist in a Sunday paper who writes that the DA is wrapped up in itself. I sent him on WhatsApp the documents that we've produced and I've challenged him. Mm. Find another political party in South Africa that is A, capable of and B, is producing documents of these types. Whether it's our blue book that Natasha was talking about, the smart lockdown model, COVID-19 action plan for incapable state, the plan for rural safety, the plan to um, be able to create an inspector general of intelligence. There's no other political party that is less wrapped up in itself and more determined to find solutions for the people of South Africa than this party. And they need to get with the program. For goodness sake, don't just write stuff, you know, tropes that you, that you think are the reality. Do a bit of research and see for yourself. The DA website is replete with every one of those solutions that we have. You know, really it's lazy analysis to, to, to make those, to repeat those, those tropes that are just simply not borne out by the facts. And that for me is, more, is, is quite important, John, that, you know, as the official opposition, we also, it's, it, we don't only hold government to account, mm -hmm. but also we propose workable solutions okay. to say we've done the work, here's how we can assist. Because ultimately, in a, especially in a time of crisis like this, these are lives at stake. Mm. We, you know, we don't have time to be politicking. We, we are saying, here are the mm. solutions. Use them. You don't have to credit us. Mm. Use them, but let's get people working exactly. and let's save lives. So, John, I mean, I want to come back to uh, the president's uh, mm. State of the Nation address tomorrow. Mm. If he had to say one thing tomorrow and one thing only, what would it be? He has to deal with the three Vs. <laughs> Volts, vaccines, and violations. Those are the elephants in the room. What are vaults? Volts Electricity has got to oh, okay. deal with the restructuring of this obsession with state control of monopoly and that is causing uh, terrible service delivery. We're now not only in a, in a pandemic uh, crisis, we've got rolling blackouts. That is going to have a deep effect on the ability to roll out a vaccine mm. that requires refrigeration. So those three Vs are very important. Vaccines has got to have a, a rollout strategy, not the PowerPoint presentations that that they have been presented to date and we're told that's a plan. That's flim flam, it's, it, there's no substance there. We want plan. We want a plan on a restructuring of the economy, a reform agenda, breaking up state control and giving people back power over their lives and, and their futures. And we need to deal with the violations, corruption, maladministration, and the fact that his own Secretary General and now the Deputy Secretary General have essentially rubbished the Zondo Commission said that pre former President Zuma has done nothing wrong. And the president has not said one word to rebuke them. Mm -hmm. Not one word. Mm -hmm. Now, Well, he said give President Zuma time to reflect. Well, he's had, I mean, give time to reflect. The guy's had, you know, over a decade to reflect. I mean, he's done so much reflecting. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's, it's beyond understanding. <laughs> yeah. uh, he's got to take action. Mm -hmm. Courage means standing up to your own associates. 
And we haven't seen that courage from the president yet. Mm. Mm. John, isn't it interesting, though, the one municipality in the country that could look after the vault section of that V mm. happens to be the municipality of Stellenbosch, mm. who, if they get it right, will be the first municipality in the country mm. to be completely free of any load yeah. shedding, but, yeah. thus protecting their hospitals, clinics, schools, mm. universities, old age homes. And that is because the so-called whining has paid off mm. and the, the uh, municipality of Stellenbosch has gone ahead and put out tenders for private electricity mm. supply. But it's not only them. I mean, mm. let's look at the city of Cape Town as yes. well. Now, the city of Cape Town comes into for, for endless flack, you know, all the time. No one actually really appreciates uh, what they've done. So when Cape Town, when the when the nation has staged two load shedding, the Western Cape and the city of Cape Town particularly are able to mitigate against that because they've put in place plans to keep factories open, to keep businesses rolling, to keep refrigeration units going. Mm. Spaza shop owners don't have to lose a whole day's worth of stock because mm. their fridges and freezers are off. These are all important things mm. that make a real tangible difference mm. in people's lives. This is not pie in the sky mm. theory or you know that sort of uh, you know dreaming of like, like bullet trains. That these are practical differences that make a difference in people's lives every single day. And you know what's more important? Uh, we, uh, what's also quite critical is the fact that the DA not only has tried to do this, has also tried to get this emulated in other parts of the country Absolutely. through legislation that we brought to parliament. Because sometimes I want to bust this myth where people say, well, you're only looking after the Western Cape. We are in government in the Western Cape, and so there's leeway for us to implement the things that we're coming up with in the Western Cape. But it doesn't mean that our shadow ministers are not proposing these things to be emulated at a larger scale mm -hmm. across the country. Again, take the ideas. You don't have to credit us for it, mm -hmm. but save the country. Mm -hmm. So if we've seen it uh, with the, the Child Register Act, uh, Mike Waters put it together and eventually just to make sure our children were safe, Mike handed over the private members bill to the committee and children are now safer because of a bill that Mike just handed over. He said, here, take the bill, take my name off it. We have an amazing private members bill that is going to be tabled about CADA deployment. We had our own emo bill, which I offered to Gwede Mantashi. I said, if the problem is that my name is on the bill, take the DA's name, take my name off, put your name on, put the ANC's name on, let's just open up the energy supply. Mm. So we are doing the work behind the scenes and uh, it's for across the country because let's be honest we don't live in a bubble in the no. western cape we live in south africa yeah. and we want the whole country to succeed yeah. and that's our job is to make sure that south africa yeah. prospers another good example of that just mm. to come in is the was the covid 19 action plan yeah. for the incapable state yeah when we realized that government had dropped the ball spectacularly had not ordered oxygen uh, the ppe was in crisis hospitals were riddled with people lying on the floor with rats covered in newspaper with no food, fighting each other for fighting oxygen, each other mm. for oxygen mm. while they were digging graves in Gauteng while we were building field hospitals. We didn't sit back smugly and say, oh, well, you know, yeah. we've got it right here in the West again. Yeah. We tabulated the best practice from the Western Cape, which all the things that we had done and done successfully that had really saved lives and livelihoods, mm. we put that best practice into a document and said to government, look, you've dropped the ball, but here's a plan to pick it up again and save people's lives yeah. and ensure that the economy keeps moving. Mm. And that is what this party is committed to doing, fighting to make sure that people yeah. are given the power back over yeah. their lives. Regardless of what color t-shirt they wear, Absolutely. ultimately we've got mm. an obligation to represent mm. them and to represent them well. Mm. Natasha, tomorrow, mm. um, usually Sona is characterized by the red carpets, and the like, what's happening tomorrow? What can we expect in times of COVID? Well, the DA has uh, really put their foot down hard on this and we expect absolutely no fanfare. We're a country in mourning and quite frankly, we're a world in mourning. Mm. We have lost so many friends, family. In parliament itself, we've lost uh, 12 members uh, yeah. to COVID. Many of our MPs have lost family members and friends. Um, so it is not a good time in our country. We also have absolutely no money let's be honest. And any extra cent that we can find needs to be pumped into buying vaccines because it's vaccines, vaccines, vaccines. So what you will see is a very different Sona tomorrow. There is no pomp and circumstance. Uh, there'll be no big parades. There'll be no fancy dress. Um, uh, you'll be seeing a normal day in parliament, yep. a normal working day. 50 members of parliament. So 
please people mustn't think uh, that the DA is not doing its work. We're mm. only allowed five members in the National mm -hmm. Assembly mm. and two members in the NCOP. That's our limit. Yeah. Um, so we will be there and we will be representing uh, the DA. Our other members will be joining on the hybrid system. But a, a very different SONA. Um, it has to be that way because of, of the COVID pandemic. But uh, a huge saving because yeah. SONA costs a lot of money and uh, it's not necessary to have this huge pomp and ceremony. Quite frankly, uh, we were of the view that the president could have addressed us um, by the, you know, a virtual platform. Mm -hmm. However, the president felt that it was necessary to do the official opening of parliament. Okay. Um, John respects the office and, and therefore we, we agreed to, to be in the house for the official opening of parliament. But absolutely no pomp and ceremony. It's a normal day at the office for the DA. Yeah. As it should be. And yeah. I hope that out of one thing this COVID crisis is going to bring is going to bring uh, an end to that nonsense yeah. around the red carpet where you have politicians mm -hmm. parading like they, you know, uh, media celebrities rather than people's representatives mm -hmm. there to do a serious job of work. And it's so out of step with reality. Yeah. I mean, Absolutely. you've got people, like young people, over 50% of them who have no jobs. You've got mm -hmm. over 10 million South Africans who are unemployed, starving. And then you've got politicians, you know, rolling around in, in the red carpet. It's just so detached. Yeah. And people should be worried about what people are saying, not what people are wearing. Yeah. John, I was, just, I was just going to say, as mm. a, especially as a woman, I mean, mm. men are always in suits, mm. so you've got it, you know, you've got it quite easy mm. for the opening of Parliament. Mm. I have never, even as Chief Whip, been mm. asked, what am I expecting from Sona? The mm. first question I get is, who are you wearing? Mm. Who cares? Mm. I mean, we shouldn't care about this. Mm. We should care what is happening in Sona and what we can offer the people of South Africa. Yeah. yeah. I want to read a quick comment from Grant Nickel, who wrote to us. And we do really encourage people to write to us because it's, it, it also helps the conversation so that we can understand what it is that you want to hear from us and we can try and answer some of your questions. And, um, and, and Grant says, one thing for sure, the DA will always take current levels to new heights. Why don't you just get stuff done? I mean, John... Again, I mean, this is, you know, I get Grant's frustration. People are now frustrated and they want to understand, okay, fine, we understand that there's a problem with the ANC, but what's your compelling offer? A lot of people are saying, actually, opposition parties are not presenting a compelling offer and that's why we're not seeing this, the change. Well, well, look, our job is to put on the table alternatives mm. and I understand the frustration. Mm. I, I, you know, people like uh, the, the viewers written in there, I understand their frustration. But I've had a recent interaction with some people down the south coast of KwaZulu-Natal in a district called Ugu, mm. where they've had a water crisis for the last three to four years, where they literally the towns go without water for weeks on end. And, you know, the thing is, well, what is the DA doing about it? Well, uh, we can make a noise about it as an opposition, but for goodness sake, if you want us to do something about it, get us into office there. You can only really get your hands dirty and get to grips with the problems and really start to solve them when you're in the driving seat. So people need to understand that if they want the DA to do something, they want a DA difference, they want to solve those water crises, they need to put a government in place that is able to do so. Just simply you know, keeping the same old government in place, expecting a different result is insane. So if you really are frustrated with what's happening in your municipality, you're really angry about the service delivery. I come back to that old saying, you can stay as you are for the rest of your life, or you can change to the DA. Mm. And I mean, you, you, you can lend us your vote. No, mm. Nobody's saying, you know, we want to govern until Jesus comes, as Absolutely. the ANC says. We're simply saying, judge us on what we're able mm. to do, and vote for us if we're able to deliver, like we have in, in the municipalities where we have taken over. And vote us out if we don't do the job well. Absolutely. That's the other important thing to say, that you know, there has to be political, we have to start creating a culture of political accountability in the country. And that's the thing that frustrates me as well. So you see these towns that burn with service delivery protests. They dissolve the council, they have a re-election, and it's virtually the same mm. makeup of the council that comes back. Mm. You're not gonna get the change unless you vote for that change. Mm. And that's the bottom line. Natasha, quickly, I know that um, the, the Deputy Chief Justice spoke a lot about what John is talking about, around political accountability. Mm -hmm. He's been mm -hmm. incredibly frustrated at the Commission, saying, what is Parliament doing? Mm -hmm. Why are you not doing your jobs? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what, I mean he, he speaks about political accountability from the, uh, from the perspective of South Africans, but there's also something to be said about what we need to do to hold government to account in the House. 
Well, Siv, you know, I had the, the great pleasure of being able to testify in front mm. of the Zondo Commission mm. because I was very involved in, in the exposing of state capture in ESCOM and Denel and, you know, the state-owned entities. And 95% of my affidavit dealt with the fact that we had asked questions, we had asked for motions in the House to be debated, we had asked, uh, we had motions of no confidence in the President, we had asked for state capture and ad hoc committee to be established. And I think what shocked the DCJ the most was that every single member of the ANC had voted against the DA's motion to establish an ad hoc committee to inquire into state capture. And that's the question he has asked every single ex-ANC member or chairperson that has come into the Zondo Commission. Mm. He has asked them, why did you vote against it? And the answer was simply, we voted along party lines. Now, I can tell you, part of my job as chief whip is I keep the party line. That's what I do. But there is no way, no how, that the DA would ever allow any member to vote against something to deal with corruption if we were in any way involved. And that's also something I think the, the country needs to cut us some slack on. We are going to have times where someone in our government isn't appropriate and we have to remove them from office. And we have. And we have. And we will continue and to do painful. so. It's a very, very painful experience. Yeah. I speak, uh, we all know yeah. uh, my, my experience there. We've done it. We will continue to do it. If you do not operate at 100% efficacy level, you're out. That's yeah. the way we work in the DA. And people must know, you hold us to a high account, we hold ourselves to an even higher account. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. John, last words before we wrap up. Um, uh, are your expectations for tomorrow? I mean, you've said that, you know, the three Vs, um, you know, the president now has an opportunity to get his his cabinet around him. And um, and we know some of them are not have not been performing. And I mean, would there be space for him to maybe do a, sh a reshuffle? I think he definitely needs to do a reshuffle. His presidency needs a reset somehow. Hmm. Uh, it's, it's mired now in failure, in uh, missed targets, broken promises, and the fact that the president himself is now being dragged into the quagmire of state capture. He was an active participant in the Cater Deployment Committee. He now knew for three years what that Mufamadi's report had fingered both uh, Mufslobo and Arthur Fraser. Uh, he's got to count to the nation about why he then promoted them into his, mm. into his government. So he's in a very difficult position. He's going to have to pull a spectacular rabbit out of the hat mm. um, tomorrow night because I think that if, if it's a flop, he doesn't do it. He's dead man walking. Yep. The enemies of growth are going to start to circle around him very, very quickly. And, and he'll be a lame duck, certainly, for the remainder of this term. term. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Natasha. And thank you, John. I'll right. see thank you too. both uh, tomorrow night. Good to. And now we're going to move on to this week's DA at Work feature. Please take a look. and cities across the country. The city of Cape Town secured 11 billion rand in investment and over 7,000 new jobs despite the lockdown. In China, the DA administration is working very hard to reduce the 4 billion rand deficit left by the illegal ANC administrators and steps have been taken to prevent corruption. So soon we'll be able to pass an adjustment budget that will prioritize basic services for the people of this metro. And the DA's challenge against the Disaster Management Act was heard in court yesterday and we now wait for the positive judgment in our fight to protect liberties. However, now onto this week's DA at Work feature, we welcome Andrew Whitfield, who is the DA Provincial Chairperson in the Eastern Cape. Welcome, Andrew. Awesome. Thanks for having me. 
Andrew, we have you here. I mean, you we've been speaking a lot about the the, the DA in, in NMB. A lot of people are confused. We were in government in 2016 and then we weren't. And then we've really tried to wrestle our way back. So we've been talking about, you know, the success of Mayor Banga being elected. But I mean, tell us a little bit more about how we got here and where we come from, really. Yeah, well, thank you very much. It is complicated and it can be confusing. And I think that people shouldn't be hard on themselves if they don't understand everything that's unfolded in the last five years. But just very briefly, I mean, we do need a little bit of a history lesson. Nelson Mandela Bay has been a very controversial city for a very long time. And uh, for years preceding the 2016 election, Nelson Mandela Bay was systematically captured, corrupted and crippled by ANC cronies uh, and their business acolytes, as well as the politicians in the city. And that led to a sense that the, the people in Nelson Mandela Bay were desperate for change. Mm -hmm. they, they, they looked out for hope and we worked very hard uh, to provide the solutions as John and Natasha have spoken about, you know, always putting solutions on the table. Those solutions uh, met with the appetites of the voters uh, and ultimately uh, they gave us a mandate. And now the tricky thing about that mandate was it wasn't an outright majority. We got 47% of the vote or 46.8% of the vote, uh, which meant that we were compelled to go into a coalition. And as you know, coalitions can be really difficult, uh, but we have um, some really great coalition partners that we've worked really well with over the, the last five years, both in government and as well in, in, in collaboration while in opposition for the last uh, couple of years. But one of the great risks, um, which perhaps explains some of the confusion around Nelson Mandela Bay, is that if no single party gets a majority, mm. then power, the balance of power in a council can shift either way as power arrangements change. And that can create a challenge which is sometimes beyond the control of the party, even if they have the most seats, which is our case in Nelson Mandela Bay. And so what we saw over the last five years was a shift from the coalition of good governance uh, under the DA, previously Athol Trollope, and now uh, very proud to uh, call my friend Ngaba Banga, the executive yeah. mayor of Nelson Mandela Bay. Shout out, Ngaba. Shout out to Ngaba. <laughs> and, um, you know, we had this coalition of good governance, it shifted to a coalition of corruption, and it's now shifted back to a really great team of councillors in a coalition of good governance who have the city at the top of their agenda every single day, not lining their pockets. Yeah. And so we, we, there have been some legal issues and challenges. Ngabo was elected um, on the 4th of December, uh, but that was challenged. We settled with the MEC out of court because we didn't see any need to go through a long and protracted legal battle because we knew that the council would renew his mandate at the end of January, and that's precisely what they did. Cool. I mean, and then, Andrew, I mean, so when we took over in 2016, I mean, we've been saying that to the people of NMB that, you know, even though we're in a coalition government, we took over in 2016, we made some incredible changes in a short space of time. I mean, yeah. remind some people, some viewers out there, what we managed to do to turn that around. Yeah, it's, it, was, it was really remarkable. And one of the things about getting into government, and I was, I'm very proud to have been part of that team for two and a half years as a mayoral committee member. Uh, but one of the things about getting into government, the election's on the third, you form your government on the eighth, and on the ninth, people are asking why their potholes aren't fixed. And so, <laughs> you know, you are held to an impossible standard in government. So I have some empathy with my colleagues on the other side of the, yeah. the political spectrum, but the DA is sometimes held to an impossible standard. And we need to understand that Nelson Mandela Bay was so broken that we had to really dive into the fundamentals and start to balance the books, uh, look after our investments, make sure that uh, we were channeling money into the right uh, directions and getting 100 cents of value for every rand that we spent. And, and that was a big uh, mission of, uh, of Athol Trollope and his team, was to make sure that we got value for money in delivering services and also turned around our finances. And for the first time in more than 10 years, uh, the council spent uh, over 90% of its capital budget, and by the time we were out, it was about 94% of our capital budget, and 100% of our grant funding. Yeah. And that expenditure record ultimately led to windfall funding of almost 400 million coming from Treasury, which meant in an adjustment budget, you can now inject new capital into your, uh, uh, into your plans, make yeah. sure that new projects come, on, come online, new infrastructure upgrades, uh, and there was a picture of Naba commissioning a pump station, actually, which was uh, an, uh, originated five years ago when we took over. Uh, and um, due to delays in the disruption with the Coalition of Corruption, all these projects ground to a halt. Mm. And so what we always say is that, you know, uh, unfortunately, Nelson Mandela Bay went from a, a war zone of incomplete projects to a construction site of delivery uh, yeah. between 2016 and 2018. We returned to a war zone. And now, just in two months, it is quite amazing 
what the team has been able to achieve uh, yeah. in just two months. You see, Sabiba, that goes back to the point I made earlier yeah. about, about Ugu and KwaZulu yeah. Natal. You see what difference we can make when we are in the driving seat. We can get things moving. Not sitting discussing endless IDPs and theories, getting down and dealing with the pump stations, the traffic lights, the potholes, the public transport system, and the infrastructure that needs to underpin growth. Mm. And that's the difference mm. that, that, that it makes. You can be in opposition, and you know that's fine. There's a role for opposition. Absolutely. But if you really want to see the change, you've got to put the right people in the driving seat. And Mayor Banga and his team, they are doing an incredible job in such a short space yeah. of time to see a sea change in Nelson Mandela Bay again. But there's a bigger question. We need an outright majority in Nelson Mandela Bay. Yeah. We want to continue, we need an outright majority. Yes, uh, that's exactly where I was going to come to, Andrew, that, you know, we've got a local government election coming up um, this year. And obviously we're working incredibly well with our coalition partners in, in, in the metro. What do people need to do to assist us to continue with this coalition of good governance or at least, you know, delivery? Yeah, well, I think our voters expect us to win, right? And yeah. so that's why we put so much pressure on ourselves. We campaigned for 16 months solid uh, to get the DA into government in 2016. And that 47% or 46.8% of the vote that we got uh, was really close to a majority. It might not seem like it, another 4% to get 51, uh, but it was really just about 12,000 votes. That's what it came down to. Oh. And those 12,000 votes were available. Uh, these are people who we would have expected to support the DA who either didn't turn out or they um, decided to go surfing uh, instead of voting. Mm. And so we really want to encourage people to get behind the DA and understand that we're not a perfect organization. Yeah. We never campaign to be perfect, but we certainly campaign to be better and to move things forward. And that's what we've done in Nelson Mandela Bay. So yes, we work incredibly well with our coalition partners and we, you know, we always thank them for the great contribution that they make to our, our efforts in Nelson Mandela Bay. Uh, but any political party worth its salt really campaigns to win because that's the mandate their voters mm. want to give them. Mm. And unfortunately, uh, if the mandate is to co operate in coalition, then that's what we will do to the best of our ability and we will do everything we can, as you've seen, mm. to make it work, yeah. uh, as difficult as it is. Yeah. However, when we campaign, we campaign on a manifesto. Mm. That is a commitment to the people. We cannot fully implement that manifesto unless we have a majority. Absolutely. And so ultimately the voters will decide. Um, they decided mm -hmm. that they wanted a coalition government for five years. Uh, and as I said, you know, you had two, uh, two, two very distinct coalitions in Nelson Mandela Bay, one of corruption, one of good governance. And unfortunately, when there's no majority, the balance of power shifts mm -hmm. in an ebb and flow mm -hmm. uh, in the council, which leads to immense frustration. Uh, yeah. amongst the residents. So I just want to touch on that as well mm. because, you know, I see there's these new little, uh, you know, uh, startups now saying that, oh, we need independence on council. The experience though, I mean, independents are not new in council. Independents have been around since the beginning of the new system. But here's the thing. If you go around the country and look what independents have done, you generally find them falling into line with the majority party. Let's use Eko Leni for an example. There was an independent grouping called the Independent Ratepayers Association of South Africa. They campaigned, they got seats on the council. What are they doing now? They're busy propping up Imzwandile Masina, who was at the Tea Party with mm -hmm. Mr. Zuma mm -hmm. last week. Rotten administration, Ekoleni. It cannot be trusted. You've got to vote for a party that is able to have a manifesto that you're able to hold them accountable for. These independents, you know, and, and often it's, it's just that one vote that could make a difference between yeah. a council going one way or the other. And people need to be very, very careful. This romantic notion that you know, independence are the way forward. Yeah, I, I said to somebody the other day, it's like taking a rugby ball to a soccer match. We're in a political environment. Like it or not, council has got politics in it. You try and come in there, you know, trying to play a different game, yeah. you're, going to get, you're going to get stomped on. And that, and that is the reality. Andrew, I mean, local governments are broken across the country. Um, I think people, almost South Africans, have almost gotten used to bad service. Um, I know where I come from in King Williamstown, Buffalo City Municipality is a mess. It's broken beyond, beyond. What's our commitment to the people of NMB if they hold on to their end of the deal? Well, it's also a commitment to the people of the province because, I mean, anybody who's been to the Eastern Cape, John, you were there recently, Siv, you go there frequently, you're from the Eastern Cape. Yeah. You can see the expansion of ANC rotten governance uh, you know, across the province. And we need, to, we need to build a front 
against that and start pushing into the interior of our province. And so we've got big plans to win a few more municipalities in the Eastern Cape to expand that front and to show people what the DA difference is all about. And so we've got two governments in the Eastern Cape, which we're really proud of, Koha, where there's a majority, and you can see the kind of progress they've been able to make and quite scarily, one of the few <laughs> municipalities operating with a surplus. Um, you know, and they've really done some amazing stuff. Her Mayor Horatio Hendricks was on your show last week uh, on the Innovation Summit. And, um, you know, Nelson Mandela Bay, we've demonstrated in two months uh, what we're able to do with over 60 roadblocks to enforce the rules of the road. We've resurfaced hundreds of square kilometers of road filled potholes. We're bringing down the water leaks because we've got a big water crisis. And so by doing all of these things, we hope to showcase what is possible in your municipality. And Buffalo City is really, really in a bad, bad state. And so hopefully, as John said, people will realize that the opportunity to vote is now in 2021 and that the DA is the party to vote for. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew, and thank you for coming to join us. And, and, and thank you, John. Thank you, Siv. Uh, speaking about the Innovation Summit, I want our viewers to take a look at some of the key highlights from the Innovation Summit, which took place last week. Take a look at this. DA governments know that access to the internet is crucial for expanding opportunities and helping people to find work. That is why we are bringing technology closer to the people. By creating open access fiber networks and mobile apps that enable residents to connect directly with their municipality, as well as a digital jobs database to help our residents find work. In 2018, the city of Cape Town faced a dire water shortage and the imminent threat of a day zero. But with public awareness campaigns and demand and pressure management, the city was able to dramatically reduce water consumption and get through the drought, winning worldwide acclaim. Ongoing efforts to get more water sources on board include pumping water from one of the biggest underground lakes in the world and investigating fog harvesting on the iconic Table Mountain. To improve water security, our municipalities are drilling boreholes, upgrading water treatment works and doing leak repairs. And DA-run Koha is home to South Africa's first highly cost-effective solar-powered plant converting salt water into clean water. Until South Africa is free from the hold of ESCOM, load shedding will continue to wreak havoc on the lives of our citizens and our economy. The city of Cape Town is also a perfect example of how governments can innovate to make our energy supply more reliable by installing rooftop solar systems on city buildings, retrofitting traffic and street lights with LED lights and installing smart electricity meters. The city's waste to energy project extracts harmful greenhouse gas generated by our rubbish and converts it into energy. Our biggest threat is still COVID-19 and DA governments are committed to protecting the lives and livelihoods of all South Africans. During this pandemic, the DA-led government rolled out intense community screening, education and testing, prioritizing vulnerable patients who are most at risk from the virus. In just six weeks, the Cape Town International Convention Center was transformed into the largest field hospital in Africa and it helped more than 1,500 patients while it was open. The Red Dot Taxi Initiative was created to take care of the hard-working healthcare workers, transporting nurses to and from work safely and on time, carrying over 70,000 passengers to date. In partnership with Uber, more than 700,000 parcels of chronic medication have been delivered to patients' homes. Where we govern, we will continue to put residents first, finding new and innovative ways to improve the lives of all South Africans. And that's a wrap from Zanz Africa. On Thursday from quarter to six, you can join us right here for a build up and exclusive analysis of the 2021 State of the Nation Address. We will take you inside Parliament with our MPs on Sona Night and unpack exactly what to make of the President's address. Until then, keep it tight, Mzansi.